Uh, so, uh, a couple months ago, I found myself sitting in the waiting area of a pharmacy feeling guilty. And to be clear, this is not a new feeling for me. See, I am the result of a bunch of immigrants who came straight to Chicago from Ireland and Poland. And the main thing that Ireland and Poland have in common, as you maybe know, is the Catholic Church. <laughs> I was raised very Catholic, preschool to college, Catholic school. And there's a thing that happens to you around the time you're seven or eight when you're raised Catholic, and that is you are told it's time to make your first confession. Mm -hmm. And what that involves is you're sent into a wooden box <laughs> where you kneel and talk through a screen to a man you don't know very well who does not have children and therefore usually doesn't know how to talk to children. <laughs> and the idea is that you're to tell him all the ways you have failed God. <laughs> and there's a prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a prayer um, that we're taught uh, around the time of our first confession. It's called the Act of Contrition. And if you were raised Catholic, maybe you remember it. I will not bore you with the whole thing, um, but the ending, I think, is worth noting. So the ending, the way it goes, you're talking to God, and so you say, I firmly resolve with the help of your grace to sin no more and to avoid the near occasion of sin. Amen. So to break that down, you are promising God that you will never sin again in your life. <laughs> This is not really doable because A, like we're human beings, but B, um, confession is not a one and done thing. It's not like you do it once when you're eight and then it's over. It's something you're supposed to do every couple months for like the rest of your life. So the way that looks at Catholic school is that every couple months your teacher tells you all to line up, the boys line and the girls line, and you file quietly down the hallways and you get to the church with the stained glass and the bloody Jesus, and then you go back to the confessional to line up and confess your sins, and there is no option to say, bless me, Father, I haven't sinned, I've actually been really good. <laughs> you have to confess something, and you can't make something up because lying in a confessional, I think that's a mortal sin. <laughs> so, from an early age, I got very good at A, trying really, really hard to be good and never screw up, and B, paying attention to all the times I maybe did screw up in spite of myself, because if nothing else, I needed content for my next week's confession. <laughs> and so now I am a fully grown adult. It has been decades since I've walked into a confessional. I'm what they call a lapsed Catholic. But the thing of paying attention to all the times I may have screwed up in spite of myself is very much still there. And normally it's like stupid small things, like I'm at the grocery store and I get to the checkout and I realize I forgot my reusable bags and I feel guilty because I'm killing the planet. So then the next time I go to the grocery store, I bring my reusable bags, but then I feel guilty because I'm concerned that the bagging person doesn't like my bags, like maybe they're particularly cumbersome. So the next time I go grocery shopping, I bring my own bags and I bag my own stuff, but then I feel guilty because I'm worried that I'm insulting the checkout person. Like maybe they think that I think that they're not a proficient bagger. Multiply this kind of thinking times like my entire life and it's kind of what it's like in my last Catholic head. But the thing is it is not always small things. Sometimes there are actual big catastrophic things where guilt feels appropriate. And that's what's going on as I'm sitting in the waiting area of this pharmacy a couple months ago. I'm scrolling through my phone and I'm seeing images of people losing family members on the other side of the world, of people losing their homes, and of people losing their lives. And I feel guilty because nothing I do seems like the right thing to do or seems like it makes any difference. And I'm supposed to go about my normal life while people on the other side of the world are experiencing the worst day of their lives. And the thing is, I don't even need to look to the other side of the world to find big things to feel guilty about, because here in Chicago, we have our own crises. On top of all the systemic issues we already have, we now have this influx of families seeking asylum, families from Central and South America who are seeking safety and opportunity the same way that my family did when they were, came from Ireland and Poland, and they have made these long, 
scary journeys to the U.S. border, and now for political reasons, they have been put on buses and sent from warm, sunny Texas to what is now freezing cold Chicago, and folks at this point are sleeping outside on the ground, outside of police stations, and no matter how many coats I donate or meals I show up to serve, I feel guilty because it doesn't feel like enough. And the thing is, I know it's not enough because I see other people who are doing enough. They're doing more than enough. Like, for instance, I have a friend who has recently learned at this point, as I'm sitting in the pharmacy, of five families who showed up on a cold night, five asylum seeker families, they show up on a cold night to a shelter and was, were told there was no room. And so she went and conspired with the pastor of the church we both go to because yes, I've gone to the dark side and now I belong to a Protestant church. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know how it happened. Uh, I rarely show up and I'm mostly there for the coffee and rainbow flags if I'm being honest. But anyway, my friend and our pastor went ahead and opened the church basement and essentially have turned it into a shelter for these five families and now my friend and this pastor have, have pretty much are now spending 24 hours a day also in the church kind of doing all the things necessary to make this a emergency makeshift shelter and on this particular day while I'm sitting in this pharmacy I've just met another volunteer who spent all day shuttling these families to and from a clinic uh, because they have all these health issues because they've been sleeping outside including babies and so here I am doing my tiny little part. I have showed up to this pharmacy with a, name, with a list of names and birth dates. I handed it to the pharmacist. I said, these folks do not have insurance and they don't really have a permanent home. If there's anything you can do to make this affordable, I'd really appreciate it. And now I'm sitting and I'm waiting. And eventually the pharmacist calls me up and he asks again about who I'm picking up these, these prescriptions for. And so I explain again, these are asylum seeker families. Up until recently, they were sleeping on the street. Now they're sleeping in, the in a church basement and you know they, just, they really need these medications. And the first thing he says to me, he looks at me and he says, my father was a refugee, so I really wanna help you. And then he pauses, like he's trying to decide whether to go on. And then when he finally speaks, he says, I'm Palestinian. And I have family right now who are sleeping on the street, and there's nothing I can do. And so if there's some small thing I can do for these families, I want to help. And he does a few things on his computer, and he rings me up, and for seven prescriptions, I pay less than $90, which, if you have bought a prescription without insurance recently, you know that's wild. And so I pay, and I thank him, and he thanks me, and as I walk out, I'm thinking, about what a friend said to me recently. I had told her about what was going on with these folks living at the church, and she said, wow, it's like a real life Christmas story. There was no room at the inn, and so your church made room. And as I look down at these prescriptions that I just picked up, I recognize some of the names because I've been getting to know some of these families. And in particular, there's this couple, this husband and wife, and I recognize their names, and they came made this long journey with their four-year-old son, who I now, looking at the prescriptions, I realize his name is Emmanuel. And I think back to Catholic school, to those stories we were told, like the ones we were told every year at Christmas time, about the Holy Family, Mary and Joseph, going to Bethlehem and no room at the inn, and we were told about the innkeeper who, side note, I'm pretty sure never actually shows up in the Bible, but we were told about him every year, this innkeeper who made room, who didn't get stuck in guilt and could have and should have, but just did what he could and offered them a barn even if it wasn't perfect. And as I get into my car to go drive these prescriptions back to the church, to the basement, to the folks who need them, I realized that maybe I learned some worthwhile things at Catholic school after all. Thank you.